Well, friends, thank you for such a warm and wonderful welcome. It is a joy to be here with you today, to be worshiping, and oh my gosh, I got to worship outside this morning, and it was glorious. Uh, where I am, it is in Baltimore, Maryland, it is 80% humidity, so we would all be sweating through our clothes if we tried that. So it has just been an absolutely wonderful morning full of welcome and joy, and it is just so wonderful. So thank you all for witnessing God's expansive love and welcome to me this morning. And with that, folks, we are going to continue the story of Jesus and the Samaritan woman. We're going to pick up the story after they've talked about this living water. We're going to pick it up at verse 16. And so after Jesus talked to her about the water, Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you are with now is not your husband. What you have said is truth. The woman said to him, sir, I see you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me. The hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is here when the true worshipers will worship God in spirit and truth. For God seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to Jesus, I know the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all the things to us. And so Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then, all of Jesus' disciples came back. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman, but no one said, What do you want? Or, Why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, Come, come and see a man who has told me everything I have ever done. He cannot possibly be the Messiah, can he? Then the crowd left the city and were on their way to meet Jesus. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be open to you, O God and the work of your spirit. Amen. In one of my former calls as a youth director, we used to sit around the table for dinner each and every week before youth group. One day, one of my middle school youth came up to me and said, Hey, Essie, there are some kids at dinner who always end up sitting by themselves because some of the tables never make room for them. And here's the kicker. Would it be okay if I tried something new tonight? Y'all, it was at this point I both admired this student's desire to include everyone and the tender heart this youth has, while at the same time, knowing, having years of experience of working with middle schoolers, all the scenarios of what this could be were flashing through my mind. Because with middle schoolers, you just, you never quite know what they're thinking. And so I bravely or, or foolishly replied, yes. And then I quickly turned around and went back to the kitchen, hoping, not knowing what was going to happen next. And while our story this morning takes place at a well, I think about tables, like that youth group dinner table, 
that we, the tables that we gather at in our daily lives each time I read this text. I think about our kitchen tables, conference room tables, church tables at potlucks and youth group dinners. Because tables, while they can be a space of welcome, can also kind of be like a boundary. There are only so many seats at certain tables, and only certain groups sit together, and some people simply aren't welcome. And at the beginning of this story, it is made abundantly clear that this woman, the Samaritan woman, would not be welcome at certain tables, nor would her people, the Samaritans. See, Samaritans and the Jewish people did not get along. Many of us know this. There is this understanding that Jewish people often look down on Samaritans. And here's the thing. It's not because they worshipped other gods or lived radically different lives from the Jewish community. Actually, it's because the Samaritans and the Jewish people shared the same faith. Except they didn't practice it the same way. Jewish people tended to follow the letter of the laws as closely as they could, while Samaritans did not or could not. There were certain customs Samaritans could not keep, and as the story tells us, Samaritans worshipped on the mountaintop, and they didn't worship in Jerusalem like the Jewish people. And these kinds of differences created friction between the two groups and cultivated this fraught relationship that they were in for many years. And then Jesus shows up at Jacob's well and starts talking to this woman about water. And we see things begin to change. Y'all, we just met, and I'm already making confessions this morning. I have to confess, I am one of those parents who let their child watch TV and have screen time before they are two years old, okay? And my daughter, Lucy, has a favorite TV show. I mean, it's the end-all, be-all of her world. And if you are someone who knows a child in the four, five, and under category, it might be your child, a grandchild, a niece, a nephew, or really anyone in that age group, then you probably have heard of it. The show is known as Songs for Littles. However, in many households, including my own, it is more lovingly known as Miss Rachel. Now, Miss Rachel is a mom, and her goal in life is to provide ways and resources to teach kids how to communicate. This comes from a place of love and motherhood in her. Her own son had a speech delay, and she realized there wasn't any access to free resources outside the therapy he was receiving to support him as he tried to learn to communicate. So Miss Rachel, who is a teacher, and her husband, who writes music for Broadway, got together and started putting these shows together on YouTube. And y'all, my daughter loves them. She loves the songs. She loves making animal noises. And she even has started lately mimicking Miss Rachel's motions. The other day, we were reading the story of the Samaritan woman, the story we read today. We were reading it out of a Bible my daughter has that she was given at her baptism. The Bible is called I Wonder. It's an illustrated children's Bible. And at the end of each story, it offers several questions that begins with the phrase, I wonder. Through most of the story, Lucy sat on my lap, pointing to pictures or working on taking off her socks, which is one of her favorite activities. However, as I got to the last question, I looked at her and I said, Hey, Lucy, I wonder how it is that God's love never runs out. She turned to me. She took her pointer finger. She put it on her cheek and she went, Hmm. (laughs) Just like Miss Rachel. Then after a few moments of thinking, she proceeded to babble an answer to the question using words and sounds I couldn't quite catch. Maybe Miss Rachel could if she was there. Nevertheless, this question, how is it that God's love never runs out, caught her attention. Like living water bubbling up in the middle of the desert, 
This children's Bible reminds us that God's love never runs out. This is the lesson Jesus opens the conversation with the Samaritan woman. He draws her in by sharing this truth, that the living water of God, the love of God, will never end. For me, for you, for anyone. And here's the thing, this kind of interaction, this statement would have been something totally new, unheard of for someone like this woman. This is a woman who comes to the well in the heat of the day around noon when the sun is at its highest point. And it's not because it was probably convenient for her. Scholars tell us it was probably because for some reason or another she was avoiding other people. And to top that all off, She is a Samaritan having a conversation with a Jewish man. So when we cross these intersections of this woman's identity, we realize fairly quickly that she would be one of those students who probably would have been eating dinner alone before youth group. And friends, this is the woman. This is the person that Jesus tells the story to. The Samaritan woman, the story of the Samaritan woman and the water, is the longest conversation that Jesus has with anyone in any gospel. Right? We read it today. It's 30 verses long. And this is a story of love and belonging and welcome. This is only further emphasized when Jesus pulls back the curtain and reveals the truth of this woman's life. That she doesn't have a husband. She's actually had five, and the person she is with is not her husband. This is a critical piece of the text because not only does it tell us about the life of grief, struggle, and instability that this woman has faced in in the patriarchal system of the ancient world, But this part of the conversation ends with a really important phrase. Jesus says to her, you have spoken the truth. Jesus believes her. Jesus sees who she is, holy and honest and true, a person in this community who may never have been seen this way before. Jesus sees her, welcomes her, and says, you belong here. Remember back to the beginning when I said I bravely or foolishly said yes to one of my middle school youth? Well, I finished cooking dinner and I had to venture back out into the church social hall. And as I did with our volunteers to set up dinner, I. I walked out and here is what I saw. This youth had found every single table folding. Um, We had a little wooden table for the welcome desk. She took every single table in that room and made one long table that went all the way to the back of the social hall. And this this social hall is like the size of a gymnasium or a full-size basketball court. She moved all of those tables put them together, and then she came to me, and she said, now no one has to sit alone. And even more impressively, without missing a beat, our youth began sitting with different people and creating this version of what I imagine God's table to look like. It was powerful to witness, and it is moments like these that remind me of how much our young people have to offer the church right now, especially when it comes to making sure that everyone has a place at the table. I cannot help but think and imagine God's table, a place where all are welcome no matter who you are, where you've been, or where you're going, when we hear the story of the Samaritan woman. Because God's table is a table for all, and it is waiting for you, bubbling up with living water. Specifically in the text, it reminds me of the moment where Jesus and the woman are talking about who worships where, right? There's a lot in this story, so so the refresher, it comes after the water, after the husbands. 
Now, now we're talking about worshiping because she's called him a prophet, right? The woman, it's at this point that the woman reminds Jesus that because Samaritans do not worship in Jerusalem and they worship up on the mountain, that they're not really considered to be faithful people. And here is where Jesus pours in all the trust that he has garnered with this woman as he tells her that the way of living and worshiping will change. It will no longer matter where anyone worships because no one will worship like they have been. A new way is coming. A new way is beginning. A bigger table is in the works. And it's less about where you worship and the truth you find yourself living into. Here's the thing. This might be helpful as we think about this passage. The author of John at this moment where Jesus references a new way of worshiping differently, the author of John is referencing the impending destruction of the second temple. In fact, most early readers of the Gospel of John would have known because it would have already happened. And so in some ways, this is a story, is a, is a pastoral response. It's a response for those who are still reeling and trying to figure out how to live and pray as faithful people without the place or without the temple that had anchored them in their faith. And so while the story is about a singular woman and the miraculous conversation with Jesus, the Son of God, it is also a deep story of belonging and welcome for everyone. It is for Samaritans who have been pushed to the outskirts of faith, for Jewish people whose lives have been turned upside down and filled with grief, and for all of us who are looking, longing, hoping for a place at the table. When we read about the water of new life and the well and at the table, Jesus is not offering a water that will only quench our thirst. The water Jesus offers is anew, and the way that it is an invitation into a new way of living and seeing the world. It is a way of imagining God's love never running out. It might also kind of be like my 19-month-old's love for Miss Rachel. This kind of water, this kind of love offers us the capacity to rethink our own tables to pull every table in the social hall together, to create spaces of welcome and inclusion. It is the boldness to imagine what could be and where God is calling us as people of faith and the church. It is a proclamation of love and the invitation to a life brimming with fullness. The story of the Samaritan woman is a story that seeps into our hearts, reminding us that we are loved, held, and welcomed, even as we venture into a new and uncertain future. Friends, this story is for you. It is for the church. It is for all of us. May we be brave enough to hold it and bold enough to live into it with God's help and the living water in the well. Beloved, this is good news. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> and now, friends, as we have heard the word read and proclaim, I invite you to stand in body and spirit and say words that we know to be true. Please join me in our affirmation of faith. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. 
On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life in the world to come. Thank you. 